all, you might have heard, I've told you this before, but you might have heard that I work with the junior high students here, and that is an experience. If you've ever worked with 12, 13, 14-year-olds, they have a lot to say. I remember one time I was driving in with this fellowship night. It was at like a bowling alley, and on the way, I was taking them from here to the bowling alley, and while we were going there, it was just a total brag fest. You should have seen it. These 12-year-olds are bragging about all the stuff that they have, and you should have seen it. It was like this one kid says, I got a bike for Christmas. And then the kid in the front says, you got a bike for Christmas? I got an electric bike for Christmas. And it was just one up on one up. And I'm sitting there, like, I was just ready to, like, just make fun of them because I'm like, you know who got that for you? Your daddy bought that for you. Like, don't (laughs) brag about having an electric bike. You're 12. Like, how do you have an electric bike? It's like, yeah, I got the Super 73. Like, you have a, you have a $2,000 bike? How is that possible? I remember when I was a kid, like, you couldn't get a $2,000 bike if you wanted one. Like, it didn't even exist back then. Anyway, um, but it's funny to see that because you can call out that immaturity, right? You can see it. When little kids are boasting about what they have, it's super easy to see, right? Because it's like, you didn't buy that. That's not your money. You can brag about it all you want. That's fine. But the reality is you did not do anything to earn that. Well, Christians tend to do the same thing don't they? Christians tend to brag and boast about the things that they have or the status they think they have or even the spirituality they think they have. But God is going to remind us tonight in the text we're going to look at that anything you have, anything, whether it be a a good knowledge of the Bible, whether it be a Christian background, whether it be a lot of stuff, whatever you have, God gave it to you. So it's no good for any of us to boast about anything we have or anything we've even earned because God gave it to us as grace in the first place. So grab your Bibles. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians 4. We're diving into this text tonight. It's been a while. It's been like four or five weeks since we've been in the book of 1 Corinthians, but you might remember Paul is calling out a sin over and over again in 1 Corinthians 1, 1 Corinthians 2, 1 Corinthians 3. The same sin keeps going over and over again. It's the sin of pride. The sin of pride that really started all these breaks in the church. It's a sin of pride that led to disunity. It was an idea that I think I'm better and my teacher's better and my pastor's better than your pastor, which created this all these different groups within the church that didn't like one another, that could not get along. Last time we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 to 5 that talk about how Paul's trying to reorient them. He's trying to say, this is how you should think of every single minister of the gospel. They are servants of Christ, which means they're accountable to him. And they're also stewards. The idea that they're given something by God to use. And we said that not just the pastors and the preachers like Paul and Apollos, but every single one of us, we are stewards of things that God has given us. And we're supposed to use them. And it says that stewards are supposed to be found faithful. Now in verse six, we're going to pick up where we left off. Paul says, I've applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers. So he's saying all these things that we've talked about, he's called himself a master builder who's building the church. He's called himself a steward, a servant, right? The idea was somebody who's like waiting tables. He says, I'm like a waiter. I'm the one bringing the food to you. I'm not the one who created the food. I'm not the one that made it in the kitchen. I'm the one bringing it out to you. He says, I'm the one who brought you the word of God, but I didn't make it in the first place. So he says, I'm using all these illustrations and we're gonna finish all those illustrations tonight. And he says, I, I'm applying those to myself and Apollos for your benefit because I wanna teach you Corinthians something. What does he wanna teach? That you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written which is a tough little section in this verse. A lot of people have a lot of disagreements on what that means. What does it mean to not go beyond what is written? I think it's gotta be some reference to the Old Testament, what is written. It's 30 times in the Bible, in the New Testament, Paul says, as it is written, and he's always talking about something written in the Old Testament. He's always talking about the Bible, okay? So clearly there's gotta be some reference to the Bible here. He's just quoted the Bible five times at the beginning of this book. So he's saying, look, You guys, if you would only listen to what the word of God says and not go beyond it, you probably wouldn't fall into these pride traps that you've fallen into. You probably wouldn't fall into all this disunity if you didn't go beyond what is written. And he's saying, I don't want you to do that, Corinthians. Second thing is he says, I don't want any of you to be puffed up in favor of one against another. That's the second part of verse six. What does it mean to be puffed up? You've seen those puffer fishes before, right? You know what I'm talking about? 
You don't know, they're from, they're from Finding Nemo, I think. Maybe they exist in real life too, but there's little fishes that are tiny, right? And they puff up, right? They get big, right? The idea is, yeah, you don't want any of you to be puffed up. I don't want you to look down on anyone else. And he says also, one against another, I also think he's talking about him and Apollos. He's saying, look, I don't want you to look at us and say, well, Paul's better than Apollos. It's not about that. He's trying to get their mind off of that. Verse seven, the heart of our text tonight. It says, for who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? And then if you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? That's what the seventh graders were doing in my car, boasting about their electric bikes. They were acting like they didn't receive it. They were acting like they earned something. They didn't earn anything, but their parents gave them too much stuff for Christmas, I guess. And what he's saying here is, look, God has given you everything you have. So it is foolish, wrong, and even sinful to boast about what God has given you. He actually throws a little insult there. It's hard to see in the text, but it says, for who sees anything different in you? The idea is, it's like you're boasting, but why do you even think that you're better than other people? You don't even have much to boast about, right? It's like the kid saying, well, I got a, you know, a Razor scooter for Christmas. It's like, okay, that's not even that impressive, right? The other guy got an electric bike. He's saying to them, you don't even have that much to boast about, but you're still so fixated on what you have and what you think you are that you're boasting about it. He says, don't even do that. Verse eight, he says something interesting. He's actually, some sarcasm comes in here. Um, he says, already you have all that you want, all that you want. You've already become rich. Without us, you've become kings, right? You see how that was like an ascending staircase there? You have what you want. You're rich. You've become kings. Paul says, and would that you did reign so that we might share the rule with you. He's being sarcastic here. He's saying, you Corinthians are so puffed up. You think you're so great. You're acting like you're rich. You're acting like you're so wise. He says, I wish that you were actually as smart as you thought you were. I wish you did have as much stuff as you did, because if you did, we would share in the rain. He's talking about them being kings. They're not actually kings. Verse nine says, for I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. The idea of a spectacle is the idea of someone, um, like a slave in the, in the Roman era, being led through a parade into the arena. And he says, look, us apostles, the people who are doing the real work of ministry, while the Corinthians are up in the Colosseum watching the gladiator fights. He says, you guys are fighting over what seat you have in the audience, and me and Apollos and these other pastors, we're like the ones at the end of the, of the line with the chains on our hands saying, do you want to come down and join us? Because we're the ones suffering for Christ here. You guys are all fighting about what seat you have in the arena. He's like, we're the slaves that are going to get sent out to get eaten up by the beasts. So you can imagine those old you know, gladiator scenes, right? Maybe you've seen a movie about that or whatever. Right? You got these the slaves, the people at the very end who are brought out. It's like after all the entertainment has taken place, let's throw a couple slaves in there to get eaten by lions, right? Because that's what we're like. We're walking with the chains, rattling our chains, looking up at you guys in the press box and saying, hey, do you want to come down and join us? Because this is what you should be doing. You shouldn't be fighting about your status and your position. You should be engaging in suffering for Christ. He says in verse 10, we are fools for Christ's sake, but you're wise in Christ. You see the sarcasm? He doesn't actually think that they're wise in Christ. He's not actually saying he's a fool. He's saying, you guys, oh, you're so wise. We're weak, us apostles who are suffering for Christ, but you guys, you're so strong. He's, he's just calling these people out. You're held in honor, but we in disrepute. To this present hour, we hunger and thirst. We're poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless. We labor, working with our hands, which is something that they hated. Back in the day, those Greeks and Romans, they looked down on anybody who worked with their hands. They said, no, you, you know, you're not impressive unless you're working an office job, right? Not that much different than today. There's still that same kind of mentality, like looking down on people that work with their hands. And he's saying, look, we're the ones doing the hard work here. And you guys are just looking down on us. He's calling them out. It says, when we are reviled, we bless, right? When people come up to Paul and spit in his face, he doesn't say, you know what? Nope, never preaching the gospel to you. He says, I I'm willingly blessing in return. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. When slandered, that, that's the idea of someone saying something false and, and, and demeaning about your character, right? Which happened all the time to those apostles. He says, when we do that, we entreat. We ask God on your behalf. We pray for you when that stuff goes on. We've become and still are like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. Uh, this afternoon, I did something I haven't done in a while. I cleaned my floor. Um, it's kind of gross, but um, I, I felt it, the, it's weird, but in the kitchen table, the floor felt sticky, 
and I didn't know what it was, so I just got down on my hands and knees, took a towel, and just started cleaning the floor. I used a white hand towel, which was probably a bad idea, and just after a while, it was just disgusting. All the, the grime and stuff that, I, I mean, you never even see it. You don't even, I just felt a little bit of stickiness, and then I cleaned the floor, and guess what? Just disgusting grime on this. See, Paul says, that's what we are. Paul and Apollos, all the, the apostles, that's what we're like, but you're like the one sitting at the table. He says in verse 14, after all that sarcastic, just like going after these people for their pride, he says something helpful for us. He says, I don't write these things to you to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as beloved children. All right, if that hurt, right, and for these Corinthians, that had to have hurt. He's sarcastically going after them, like, you guys are so rich and so amazing, but we're the ones suffering. Right? It, was some, it was like a shameful thing. He says, look, I don't want you to be ashamed. I don't want you to stay in that position where you're so discouraged. I want you to be encouraged, admonished. That's the word nuthateo. Whenever you see the word exhort or admonish or encourage in the New Testament, that's the word right there. I'm trying to spur you on to action by saying that. Even by being sarcastic, he says. I did that to admonish you. He says, as my beloved children. And he picks up on a new analogy here. We saw a lot of analogies in chapter four and chapter three. Here's the last analogy that we're gonna see. He says, you guys are like my spiritual children. He says, I came in, I shared the gospel with you and you're, you're like my children. He says, for though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. Okay, guides, that's the idea. If you know um, Galatians chapter three, Galatians four, Paul says that the law was like a tutor or a gar- guardian for you to teach you the way to Christ. He's like, you're basically, um, you got a lot of tutors, you got a lot of people educating you, he says, but you only have one father in the Lord, which sounds odd because you're going to think, oh, that's God, right? Not God. Paul says, that's me. I'm the one spiritual father you have. What that meant was he's the one that shared the gospel. They got saved under his ministry. He says, you have one spiritual father. I became a father in Christ through the gospel. So clearly it's not that Paul did anything to change them. He says it was through Jesus, but I am your father in Christ. Verse 16, I urge you then, be imitators of me. Follow my example. Do what I do. Don't just do what I say, do what I do, which you got to be thinking when he says that, what has he just compared himself to? The scum of the world, the refuse of all things. Really? I don't know if I want to do that. Paul says, no, be imitators of me. So that's why, in fact, I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, which I think you got to catch that. He just said, you're my beloved children. What does he call Timothy? He's my beloved child too, but he's a faithful one. Okay? What have they been? Unfaithful. Okay? He says, Timothy, he's my faithful child. He's the one that's learned from me. He's the one that's going to come in and he's going to teach you. He's going to come and remind you the ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere and in every church. Verse 18, some are arrogant as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you if the Lord wills. Obviously, he can't um, create his plans without God backing his plans, but he says, and I'll find out the talk of these arrogant people. Not just that, but I'll find out their power. These arrogant people in this church who said, yeah, Paul's not going to come. He's not going to say anything to us. Um, We can do whatever we want in this church. Paul says, no, I'm coming back um, if the Lord wills, but when I come back, we're going to find out not just how good at talking these people are, we're going to see the power of their lives. Right? They say they're godly. They say they're rich and powerful and wise. Well, let's see if they've defeated sin in their life. Let's see if they're not going to be proud when I come. We're going to see their real power when I come back. Verse 20 it says, for the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. That's why we you know, don't want to, you to spend 40 hours of your week just listening to sermons. We'd like you to spend two or three hours listening to sermons and the rest engaging in the community, right? It doesn't just, it's not all about talk. It's not all about what you read. It's also about you putting that into practice, about power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love in the spirit of gentleness, okay? The rod, that's the, the instrument of discipline. You see how he's still talking like a father? He's saying, look, I can come in two ways. If you want to obey, right? It's like, uh, maybe if you grew up in a house like that, I did. Um, two parents and my dad would say, I'm going to come home. And if you don't obey your mom, we could have one of two conversations when I get back home. It could be a, a great conversation on how you obeyed and you were obedient and we got, you know, candy or dessert or whatever. Or, you know what? I could come back and I could spank your butt, right? There's two ways of going about this. And Paul says, basically to this church, those are your two options. Um, There's a lot here about pride and about obedience. And I want to just try to encapsulate what this is for us. Okay, what do we need to do because of this? A lot of times we look at this and we say, well, we want to be like Paul, right? Totally. Um, But I think the first thing we need to do is figure out if we're like the Corinthians here, if we have the pride that the Corinthians had, because maybe it's not so overt, 
You might think, well, I'm certainly not bragging about my electric bike, right? I'm not like those kids who are immaturely bragging. Well, before you say that, let's make sure that's not you. Let's identify any ways that we are pride, prideful and boasting about things that we have. This is one of the ways that you'll see your pride or your arrogance is if you're suffering for Christ. Because he says here, look, the, the people who are doing what they should be doing, they're the ones suffering. And the question for us is, are, are we embracing that position? If you're claiming to be a Christian, have you embraced the humble position of what it means to be a follower of Christ? That's point number one. I'd love for you to write that down. Embrace the humble position of a Christian. Embrace the humble position of a Christian. If you say you're a follower of Christ, I want you to know what you got yourself into. Right? Maybe nobody ever told you. Um, hopefully somebody did. Right? But tonight, let it be a warning. Right? This is what you got into if you're a Christian. You are not just signing up for eternal life. You're not signing up for um, you know, just a great community here at church. You're signing up for more than that. Okay? Those things are true. You're signing up to live for Christ. You're signing up to suffer for his sake on this planet word Christian, we talked about it this weekend if you're at main service, right? Christian is used three times in the New Testament. It's not a common word, right? In Acts chapter 11, we saw it's the first time the word comes up, right? It says they're called Christians, which was a derogatory term, right? It's the, the name that the outsiders called the Christians. They're Christians, followers of Christ. It's a derogatory term, right? It's a humble position to be a Christian. Are there benefits? Absolutely. But it, it, it needs to be a position of humility, 2 Timothy 3, Paul wrote to Timothy, said to him, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Okay? All. That means you. If you desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, you will be persecuted. Okay? We don't want to adopt some weird persecution complex where we see everything that goes wrong in our lives as, oh, it's persecution, right? I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, if you tonight are going to leave this place and say, I'm going to live for Christ this week. I'm going to stand up for Christ this week at work. I'm going to stand up for Christ in my home, whether there's people that are non-Christians around me, okay? Just get ready, right? This scripture is going to come true in your life, right? I want to prepare you for that. I want to see, okay, we are embracing a position of humility when we call ourselves Christians. Do you remember what happened to Jesus? Do you remember, right? You want to follow Christ. Where did he go? The cross. And that's what, that's what Paul's saying. Look at us. We've got our chains on too, Right? And it might not be so dramatic this week in your life. Right? You might say, oh, well, you know, persecution is not like you know, people are trying to hunt me down and kill me for, for living for Christ. It might not look that dramatic, but it is going to start to feel like this. It feels like we're being paraded around by the world as idiots or whatever they're going to call you because, oh, yeah, you serve the risen Christ. Right? You're signing up for persecution. I want us to remember that. 1 Peter chapter 4. I'd like us all to turn there. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. If you can find that, it's to the right in your Bibles. 1 Peter 4, 12. He talks to them. He says, don't be surprised, which is a helpful reminder, right? It's like, it's something we might forget, but we sometimes are surprised by. He says, don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening. This is 1 Peter 4, 12. He says, don't be surprised by that. It's going to be a temptation when you face persecution and think, oh, I, I, why is this happening to me? I've been living righteously. I mean, I've, I've been trying to be the good guy at work. I've been trying to be a nice lady at work. And why, why is it all this, you know, persecution, pressure? Well, don't be surprised. It's not something strange that's happening to you. It says, but rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. And when Jesus comes back, the ultimate vindication for your faith will happen. Right? Sometimes we don't even think about that day enough as we should. Jesus is going to come back and prove that everybody who ever stood against Jesus Christ will have their forehead against the ground, bowing to him. Right? That's what's going to happen when Jesus comes back. His glory will be revealed. So, so we're going to rejoice when that happens. But verse 14 says, if, if you're insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Right? Think that through. If you are insulted, because you might say, well, it's not like I'm, my house isn't being taken away. I'm not like being run out of town or the government's going after me. Yeah, maybe not. But do you, you like how he just throws you the softball right there? Right? If you're insulted, which will happen this week if you are faithful to do what God tells you to do. Right? Just think about it. If you are faithful to stand up, if you're faithful to open your mouth, to share the gospel, this is going to happen this week. Okay? He says, if you are insulted, you're blessed. But Verse 15, this is very important. Let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. 
Right? This is the anti-persecution complex verse of the Bible, right? Don't think that every time something goes wrong for you, it's because you're just suffering for Jesus. He says, no, no, no. There's a lot of ways you could suffer in this life as a murderer, right? That's bad. Don't be a murderer. So you'll suffer as a murderer. Or as a thief. You're stealing stuff? Okay, yeah, you might suffer. Or as an evildoer. It's like it's going from big sin to a, a smaller sin. Theft is still a big sin, right? But then an evildoer, any evil, or a meddler. Just like getting in people's conversations, right? It's like, that's a small thing. It's not even like an evildoer thing. It says it's, it's a descending staircase there on qualities of sin. You might think the first one's big, but as you go down the line, it's like, well, even that? Well, even that? It says, well, if you suffer for being a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler, don't act like you're suffering for Christ. Yet, verse 16, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed but let him glorify God in that name. It's one of the other times the word Christian shows up in our Bibles. It's very rare, right? We just looked at two of them, Acts 11, 1 Peter 4. Those are two of the three times that word Christian shows up. But if you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed. Jesus put it like this in Matthew chapter five. He says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Blessed, that means happy. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account, which will happen this week. If you're faithful to do what God wants you to do, you, people will utter evil things about you falsely. Right? It's not true. We'll call you hateful, right? Not, no, I'm not hateful. I'm not hating you, right? I'll call you a bigot. Like, I'm not, no, I'm not, I'm not a bigot. It's, not what's, it's false accusations against you. It's exactly what Jesus promised. He says, but rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Problem with the Corinthians was they were not exactly about getting persecuted. They were into saving their own skin, which is what we naturally all will do. That's why sometimes it's hard for us to share the gospel because we know if I start this conversation, I might get rejected, right? That tension in your heart, right? When you're about to do it, but you're not, oh, I don't know if I should, right? That's the tension. He's saying, just take that step, get past that, okay? Because if you're being held back, you're probably gonna end up like the Corinthians at some point here. Jesus calls out a group of people too. It's not just Paul who does this. In Revelation chapter three, Jesus called out a church in Laodicea. He said, you guys say that you're rich, that you've prospered, that you need nothing, not realizing that you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. As I counsel you to buy from me, take from me what you need, the gold refined by fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. Those whom I love, Jesus says, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Which is exactly what Paul's getting at. What does he call them? My beloved children. This sermon feels like a rebuke to you, right? And maybe it is, and it definitely was to me studying it this week, right? Well, just know this. If it feels like a rebuke, and it is a rebuke, just know that you're one of God's beloved children, that he's wanting to conform to his image. Even Paul. You might not think of Paul as a very prideful person, but there is a time in scripture where he says, I was tempted to be proud and God did something to me to keep me from being conceited. You might know where I'm going here. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter seven, what does he say? There's a thorn in my flesh. God gave him some physical ailment, some kind of illness, chronic pain. I right? don't know what it is. Some people think something with his feet, something with his eyes, not sure, okay? But he says, there was chronic pain in my life. Why? He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, so as to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, right? He has this tight relation with God. He sees things that you and I don't see. A thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. It's interesting there. He attributes it to, to Satan, but also to God, right? It's like pain, right? It's like, oh, is this from Satan or from God, right? Well, maybe both, right? Because it's keeping me from becoming conceited, but it really hurts, Okay. That's what he's saying. Even he had to be corrected from becoming conceited. If you're a Christian, you think that um, for some reason that's going to help you in life, and hopefully you don't think that. Um, just know it's a lot like um, changing diapers. I was thinking about um, the thing I'm least looking forward to about having a child. Um, and I'll do it. I just really, I just, it just really grossed me out. We, we watched our uh, nephew the other day, um, who's also a little baby. And the dude pooped everywhere, just <laughs> everywhere. It was disgusting, right? And you, you saw his face. He kind of like, you know, a little corner of his mouth smile when he did it. And everything it was so evil. Um, anyway, and you know, sitting there pooping, we're like, all right, we got to clean this up. Um, 
it didn't come out, but whatever. Point is, um, <laughs> point is, is a lot, right? More than I thought. And, um, you know, I, I'm not exactly all about, you know, changing my nephew's diaper, but Alexander's like, I need help with this one. And I held his feet up <laughs> and it was just disturbing. It was disturbing. I forgot. I didn't, I thought we're going to do this like every day. This is going to happen not just once. This is going to happen like five times a day. I can't believe. Okay, all right. Well, this is, this is, this is happening, right? And if I thought, yeah, you know what? I should, I should have this child so that I can receive honor. Because the Bible says honor your father and mother. Having a child will bring me honor. Well, just know it's a little bit humbling too. It's a little gross, right? Sometimes your hands got to get dirty, okay? Becoming a Christian, you might feel like, oh, yeah, it's gonna, the, the end is great. And it is. But just remember in the meantime, right, before we reach the end, it, there will be some gross things that you have to do. Um, hopefully not change diapers, but um, there will be some hard things that you will be uncomfortable with. Christ will call you just like he called the disciples when they're fighting about who's the greatest. Remember this in Matthew chapter 20? Or they're fighting who's the greatest? Who's going to sit the right hand and the left hand of Jesus? What does Jesus say to them? He says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles, they lord their authority over people. They exercise authority over, over people. Those are the great ones, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever will be great among you must be your servant, and whoever will be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. It's something, something we have to keep in mind as we serve the Lord. Embrace the humble position of a Christian. The Corinthians, they lost that. Paul has to remind them of that. Next part of this passage in verse 14 to 21, what does Paul do? He says, you guys need to receive this admonition carefully. Receive it carefully. Receive it as the discipline it is. Don't think it's Paul lording his authority over them. It's not that. It's not some mean guy calling out all your sins and telling you you're, you're a horrible person. Right? That's not what's happening. Although, if you viewed it immaturely, that's what it would feel like, wouldn't it? Some dude, Paul, far away, writing about how prideful you are. Like, who is he to tell me what to do here? They could have felt that way. But we see in different occasions here in the book of 1 Corinthians, we actually see it mostly in 2 Corinthians, that they receive this counsel. And the counsel's only gonna get harder. Next time, we're gonna look at 1 Corinthians 5, and it is just hardcore what he's telling these people to stop doing and start doing. But the thing for us is we look at all these passages about discipline and correction, we need to realize that sometimes God will use people in your life to bring about this, this admonition, just like with Paul. And you might say, well, I don't want anyone admonishing me unless they're an apostle. Right? Well, the truth is, if you're part of this local church or any local church, sometimes it feels like when you're in small groups, you're having a conversation, maybe someone's taking you through partners, or maybe it's in a sermon here, maybe it's in main service, and you feel like, I'm really being called out right now. I'm really being admonished. Okay? As we talked about this weekend in the main service, we need to see that as the loving act that it is from your shepherds, from your spiritual leaders, and we need to take it rightly. These Corinthians, they took it mostly right. We want to take it completely right. So point number two, I'd love for you to write this down. Embrace tough correction from your spiritual leaders. Embrace tough correction from your spiritual leaders. The main thing here to get is imitate me, right? Verse 16, I urge you, be imitators of me. Paul says, just look at my life and try to follow it. And that might sound prideful, right? It's odd. Is it weird that Paul is calling out their pride and he's saying, follow my example, right? Is that proud? Right? You could be a skeptic and say, well, Paul is clearly the proud guy here. And that's often what happens. Right? If you're corrected by a spiritual leader, you know the, the main charge that spiritual leaders get, right? It's that, oh, you're just proud. You're just arrogant. Right? And that is true sometimes. But the reality is it's better to receive instruction and discipline, even from a prideful person, than to reject it. And Paul certainly is not being proud here. He's doing the best thing for him, which is why later in the book, 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, he says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Okay? I don't think what Paul's saying is you need to be a tent maker like me. Okay? It's not what he's saying. I mean, in some ways, yeah, he says some, some of you guys should get to work because you're being really proud, but you don't have to be a tent maker. Right? It's not that you have to conform every aspect of your life like a cultish way, right? You know, cults like, oh, I want to dress like the leader or look like the leader, say things like, like that's not what Paul is saying, right? You know, history says that Paul was an ugly, short guy, right? He's not saying everybody, right, just, you know, look like me, dress like me. I don't think that's what he's trying to say, but here's what he is saying. Adopt the servant mentality that I have and receive this instruction. He says, don't, don't take this as shame. Is it shameful? Yes. Should they be ashamed? Yes, but says, don't stay ashamed. I want you to receive this as an admonition. I think whenever we're thinking about learning anything, we learn better 
by example. You can be taught a lot of things. You can be lectured on a lot of material. Right? But just remember, back in high school and college, right? do you remember much of what you learned in high school and college? Probably not, right? You heard a lot of things, but you probably didn't retain a ton. But there are things that you did. Some of you were athletes. Some of you were in the band. Others of you did things. You could probably get that trumpet back, and you could probably, if your embouchure is good, you could probably figure out how to make some notes. Right? You football players, you could probably throw those pads on, and it, you probably don't fit as well as you used to. Right? But you could still kind of do the same thing. Why? Because it was drilled into you. By pattern, in repetition, you did it. I mean, it's the same thing with little kids, right? You ever find it impressive that these little kids learn a complicated language like English? Right? They can't even wipe their butt, but they learn how to speak English, right? I can't, I, you ever try to, try to learn a foreign language? It's hard to do, right? But they do it. How? Well, they're, they're hearing, seeing, right? They're just giving all their attention to just, just learning, and they're, and they're doing it. They're picking it up. It's amazing that they're able to do it. Why? Are they sitting in classes getting lectures about the English language? No, okay? They're just seeing it practiced, and they're practicing it themselves. That's the same thing with the Christian life. There is a time and a place for careful study. I'm not saying it's not true, but there also is this great necessity on us putting our faith into practice, not just talking about it. That's what he says here. He says, look, I, this, this, this talk that these arrogant people have, it's all talk. It's no power. It's no work. Hebrews chapter 13 talks about following spiritual leadership. And I want you to think about spiritual leadership, right? This is a hard thing for pastors to preach about, right? Because it's an awkward one. Let me just assure you, this is a hard passage for me to study because I find all the ways that I fall short of how Paul is as a pastor, right? Paul's bold. He's never a people pleaser, right? But sometimes I am, right? I, I, he boldly goes for the jugular when he needs to, right? But then there are times when it's like, oh, should I tell that person? No, I, I don't know. They might think I, I'm overbearing and, and you know, fade away. We all have issues, right? I have issues looking at this passage too for myself. But Hebrews 13 says, remember your leaders, right? And I want you to think of who they are. They're your small group leaders. If there are people that maybe, you know, are from a different church, maybe some of the people you knew when you became a Christian, maybe in high school or junior high or whatever, right? Remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God to you, not apostles, okay? In Hebrews, we think they're actually second generation Christians. They're probably just ordinary, you know, men and women, just like the people that you think of that are your spiritual leaders, they're ordinary men and women. But he says, remember them, consider the outcome of their way of life, and imitate their faith. Right? I think you probably all think of leaders who their outcome of life is bad because they were fakes. Okay? You probably think of those people, but I hope you can also think of some people who were legit. I hope you can also think about the people who really taught you the word, whether they were Sunday school teachers or whether they're pastors or whatever, who really taught you the word and they're running solid. He says, remember them. Then he says in verse 17, Hebrews 13, 17, obey your leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account, right? Your leaders, your small group leaders, your pastors will stand before Christ on the bema seat judgment and answer for how they dealt with you. That's a big responsibility, which is why James 3 says not many should be teachers. But he says, let them do this job with joy, not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. No advantage if your leaders don't like you. <laughs> Just like if you're a kid, right? There's no advantage if you make your parents' life a, a misery, right? They're not going to treat you well. Well, that's the same thing. Paul had people that he was shepherding, right? Hopefully, like the Corinthians, you have people in your life who shepherd you, and I want you to think about their way of life. Now, this whole passage is built on an idea that I don't want to miss, and I think that there is some, maybe some cognitive dissonance between then and now on this topic, okay? He talks about parents and fathers and discipline, okay? Just for a few minutes, I want to talk about that because some of you might be coming at this from a wrong starting place, okay? Obviously, in the scriptures, God is presented as father. And with that imagery, there's a lot of connotations that that has. And even Paul is addressing them as, as like, I'm your spiritual father, okay? If you think that this passage right here, where he says, I'm coming to you with a rod, okay? If you think that's sinful, evil, and abusive, okay, you don't have a biblical view of what a father and a child is like, okay? I know it might seem secondary and not important in this passage, but I think it's very important because if you look at this, and this is very common today, um, people are very quick to say that any leader in my life who spiritually was trying to push me towards godliness, 
if you're quick to call that abusive, right, you're probably starting at a place where you think carrying the rod is abusive, okay? The scriptures over and over again tell parents to do that. Now, what I'm not saying is that spiritual abuse doesn't exist, just like I'm not saying that physical abuse does not exist between fathers and children, right? There's a difference between a father coming home to a child who has sinned, broken the family rules, grabbing the paddle, grabbing the rod, and spanking them. There's a difference between that and a dad coming home and getting drunk and beating his kids just because he likes to beat his kids, okay? There's a difference there, okay? Paul is saying, I'm like a loving father that's supposed to discipline you. And maybe if your idea of fatherhood and being a child and father does not in- involve discipline, I want to give you some passages to write down. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24 says, whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is dis- diligent to discipline him. So what this is saying is the, the job of a parent, right? I know it seems you know, not primary, but it is primary to understanding this, Whoever spares the rod hates his child. So maybe you grew up in a house where there's no discipline at all, okay? No correction, no guiding, right? Hopefully there was some guiding. You're here, you know, you're wearing clothes, you brush your teeth, right? There was some guidance, okay? But maybe there wasn't a lot of guidance. The scriptures say that if you hate your child, here's what you should do. Leave them on their own. Let them decide who they want to be, right? Let them dress themselves every day, so to speak. And I'm not saying you can't dress yourself. I'm just saying the idea of the principle of always letting them do whatever they want to do is not a helpful thing in scripture. Here's why. Later, Proverbs 22, 15. Proverbs 22, 15 says, folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. Okay. It's the same thing as when um, little babies poke themselves in the eye. I don't know if you know that. That happens often. I don't know if Mike is listening to this sermon, a uh, little eight-day-old Mike or whatever. Um, he probably right now has done, has he poked himself in the eye? He has, okay? Here's what he's going to do over the next couple weeks. He's going to learn through pain not to poke himself in the eye, correct? Okay? Hopefully, right? Is that an evil thing that God has done to him? I can't believe God gave him that, those pain sensors. What pain God is causing him? Is that? No. He's like, no, of course not, because he's learning not to hurt himself through pain. It's the same thing with a father and a child. He's supposed to cause some type of pain to keep him from doing the things he ought not to do. Later on, Proverbs 23, 13, do not withhold discipline from a child, which is an easy thing to do, right? If you look at your child and say, oh, so cute, so cute, right? I just don't want to don't want to discipline them. I want to please them. I want to make them happy. Okay, don't withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. Okay? If you strike him with a rod, you will save his soul from Sheol, right? the idea of hell, right? the grave. You're going to keep a kid from dying. Kids do stupid things, right? Obviously, you've been a kid. Maybe you did your fair share of stupid things, right? Um, But it says discipline keeps that from him. So when you're viewing this, don't think, okay, this is some weird, crazy thing. I can't believe, you know, he's saying discipline. That is a part of the godly family structure that God organizes in his word. Another passage for you, Hebrews chapter 12. Okay, Hebrews 12 is super clear about this. This time he doesn't just talk about father and child discipline. Now he says God has instruments of discipline for the Christian, which you might think, wait a minute, wait a minute. How can God discipline one of his children? Are you sure that God will cause pain in the life of his kid because of sin they commit? Absolutely. Okay, here's what Hebrews 12, verse 7 says. For it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Which is so funny because in Bible times, right, it's assumed like, oh, there's no kid that's not disciplined by his father, right? Okay, that's, see, that's where the, there's a cultural difference between today and then. Right? If I ask this question, what child is there whose father did not discipline him? Like half the hands in the room go up, right? It's like, well, I, maybe my dad wasn't around or I didn't, you know, they didn't really discipline. They weren't into, you know, they didn't really punish me. They kind of let me choose my own path in life, right? Okay. He's assuming that everyone does that. Okay. So verse eight, if you are left without discipline in which you have all participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. He's like, look, if God is not making your life painful at times as a direct result of your sinful actions, if God never disciplines you, you're not even legit because God disciplines his sons. His daughters who go astray, he disciplines them. He brings them back to himself. 
He causes some type of pain, whether it's emotional, spiritual, whatever, right? Physical even, sometimes with sickness. Yeah, God can bring you back to repentance because of things he puts in your life. Verse nine, besides this, we've all had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them, right? Again, do you see the difference in culture, right? You can't all say that we all had fathers who all disciplined us. So I know we, we can't start to the same place that they were at. It says they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good. The all-knowing God who knows all things that's best for us, God disciplines, thing, makes things hard for us, for our good. It says that we might share in his holiness. You would not be holy if God did not bring discipline into your life. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. Duh, right? Easy. Of course, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who've been trained by it. Okay. Discipline is meant to train. So when Paul is coming in saying, hey, if you guys don't behave, I'm going to discipline, right? He's not saying he's going to you know, take him behind the shed and beat him up. That's not his point, right? But there is going to be some consequences. In the same way, there are consequences when we disobey God, and God will make sure the discipline is met out either through people or circumstances. Now, when you think of discipline, I want you to be appreciative of discipline. Do you know that there are people, probably in this room, who pay people hundreds of dollars to discipline them? Okay. If you have a personal trainer, anyone want to be bold enough to say they have a personal trainer? Nobody? 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 Okay. One, one or two? Okay. So you pay hundreds of dollars a month, or like a week if they're expensive, to be disciplined by somebody. You're crazy, right? You're crazy, right? Unless, unless you really want what you're getting by that discipline, right? Right, if you're in a sport, what, what athlete here says, oh yeah, discipline, terrible, don't like it? No, no, it's like, no, I had to be disciplined. I would never get better at my sport if I wasn't disciplined, right? I never get better at whatever health thing you're trying to do when you got a personal trainer if I wasn't disciplined. That's why you pay someone to discipline you, right? Here's, here's what Paul's saying, right? Think of me as one of those people in your life who's your personal trainer, okay? And he says, I do it for free, <laughs> right? But just know, I, I do it because I love you. So, if you think about spiritual leaders you have, if you're dodging accountability, right, if there's people in your life that are holding you accountable for things and you're dodging it, stop dodging it, okay? Stop dodging it because God will bring discipline one way or another. If you're a prideful person, I mean, you might not think of yourself as prideful, but if you look down on something maybe a biblical counselor is telling you to do or a pastor is telling you to do because you think, well, they don't know, right? I know they think I should do this. I know they think the Bible says this, but you know, I, I, don't, I don't think that's true. I should really, I'm going to do my own thing, right? If you're doing that, stop it. Okay, because you're, you're, you're being like the Corinthians. Maybe oh, it's on the other side of the spectrum. You're completely isolating yourself from all counsel, all other Christians, because you don't want to be told what to do in your life. That's wrong too. Okay? So when we think about how do we really apply this point, embrace tough correction from your spiritual leaders. It means being open. It means being honest. It means being saying, yes, I don't understand. And sometimes you're in situations where your pastor or your counselor says, hey, you know what? This is the godly course of action here. You really need to do this. And you say, I don't understand why that's true. Right? I remember being a kid, not wanting to save my money. I remember that too, right? But my parents say, no, you need to save your money, right? We're going to take, if you don't save it, we're going to take it from you so that you will save it. Okay, fine. I'll do it. I don't understand why, but I guess it was a good thing. And it was helpful, right? Same thing with you. I don't know why if you're a basketball player. I don't like, you know, running those suicide sprints, right? I don't like it, right? Okay, well, do you understand it now, right? As a more mature person, there are some things that your spiritual leaders will tell you to do that you don't understand at the time. You might need to say, okay, I'm gonna do it. There are times when that hurts. But I want you to now step into Paul's shoes. We were just in the Corinthian shoes, learning from their example. What about Paul? If you think about all this text, how hard was this for Paul to do? You might think, well, it would be easy to be the personal trainer, right? I like yelling at people, right? Rather than being the one yelled at, right? It might feel easier, but it's not easy for Paul to be a spiritual leader. And when you think about your life, you might think initially, you read this text and you think, okay, I associate with the Corinthians because I'm not a spiritual leader. Never will I be a spiritual leader, okay? I want to challenge you on that to, rem to have you remember that God calls each and every one of you, if you're a real Christian, he calls you to reproduce disciples. I mean, he calls you to be somebody who's becoming a spiritual leader in someone else's life. And if you never do that, you're like Hebrews chapter five and six. He says, you guys are like, you should be teachers by now, but, but you're still having to be taught the elementary things over again. I want you to think, slip into Paul's shoes here and think, I, I wanna embrace this challenge. Point number three is embrace the challenge of reproducing disciples. Embrace the challenge of reproducing disciples. 
It's a hard thing to do. It's not easy. It's uncomfortable. You might lose friendships because you're trying to disciple somebody and they don't like what you're having to say and then they say, oh, I don't want to hang out with you anymore. Well, that's the risk you're taking by becoming a spiritual leader. Paul says in Galatians 4 about those Christians, he says, my little children for whom again I'm in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Right? That sounds like it hurts, childbirth, okay? He says, that's what it feels like to have spiritual leadership. It's like, ah, oh, this hurts. Like, I want you to do the right thing. Just please, just please obey God. Please do what God says. Please get in prayer. Please read your Bible. You haven't, you've been avoiding that counsel. Please, please read. Please obey. It's just like the spiritual leader. Paul's like, I'm like giving birth. It hurts until Christ is formed in you. All right, now think, okay, are there people in my life that I can say that about? There are people that I, I, it, it hurts and it, there's anguish because I just really want them to have Christ formed in them. First Thessalonians 2, Paul says, we were gentle among you when we were with you. This is First Thessalonians 2, 7. Says, we were gentle like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share not only the gospel of God, but even our own selves. Right? When we were with you, these Thessalonians, right? Only we're with them for a short amount of time that, that they get saved. He says, not only were we ready to share everything we had, we were ready to share ourselves with you. We're like a mom that just had a baby. We we're ready to share everything because you were very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day. We didn't even want to charge you any money. We didn't want to be a burden to you. While we proclaim the gospel of God, your witnesses. God also is a witness to this. How holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct towards you believers. For you know how like a father with his children. He just said, we were like a mom with his kid, with her kid, right? Now he's saying, we were like a father with his children. What did he tell them to do? Exhorting, same word as our text, exhorting, admonishing, correcting. We were exhorting each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you in his own kingdom and glory. Paul says later, 2 Corinthians 12, 15, I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls and he says, if I love you more, am I to be loved less? He's saying it, it, it hurts when these Christians that he's trying to help are, are not responding. And I want you to slip into that position too. Because if you're a Christian, one of the roles that God has called you to is the, a disciple maker. You're someone who's directing other people's affection, love, attention, and even lifestyle towards Christ-likeness. Okay? Jesus said it like this in Matthew 28. Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you. 2 Timothy 2, in another passage, he says, what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who are able to teach others also. That's how this church goes on. Right? It doesn't go on by having a bunch of babies. It goes on by winning souls, lost souls to Jesus Christ. But you might be in this, right? Some of you are spiritual leaders. Maybe you are, are leading in Oana or you're doing things with the youth ministries here or maybe you're... Uh, just taking part in, in some adult fellowship, maybe your women's Bible study, men's Bible study, and you have people in your life right now that you can say, yes, I am trying to see them be one to Christ. I am trying to see them change to Christ's likeness. I have those people, okay? I want to give you one simple encouragement. It's an encouragement that Jesus gave. In John chapter four, Jesus was ministering to people, specifically the woman at the well. This is John 4, 31. He said to these people, people, the disciples come up to Jesus and say, Jesus, hey, did anybody get this guy food? We haven't fed him in so long. Um, Jesus, do you have any food? Um, he says, no, but I have food you don't know about, okay? My food is to do the will of the Father who sent me. Okay? He says, that's, that's my food. That's what gets me excited, not by, you know, having a bunch of sandwiches and salads like we had tonight. Um, no offense to the sandwiches and salads. Those were awesome, but he says, my food is not that, okay? My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Then he turns to the disciples and he said, hey, everybody, eyes up. Look over here. He says, yet there are four months. Then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes. Look at all these people, right? In the scene, it seems like there's people coming out to meet them at this point. Or at least he's looking at the city of Samaria and he's saying, look, everybody, look, the fields are white for harvest, right? You can imagine, you know, these plants growing up and there's, it's, it's time to harvest. He says, that's what this city is like right here. There's people that need to know me. They need to re repent of their sin. They're, they're ready right here. I mean, think about our community. There are people that are ripe. Think about every day you go to a workplace where there are people that are ripe. That's the helpful thing about living in a culture that's not super, you know, pro-Christian. 
right? The, the fields are white for harvest, right? Go to try to do evangelism, you know, in the South. It's harder to do because they all think they're Christians. They all think they're good with God, right? Here, it's a little easier, right? They're ready to be picked. They're ready to talk about spiritual things because they never talked about them before. The fields are white for harvest. Be encouraged that Jesus took comfort, like food, in doing what God said. I don't know if this ever happens to you. It happens to me sometimes, more often than I'd like to admit, but um, I'll be on you know, social media or whatever, and you scroll, 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 scroll some more, keep on scrolling. And then you keep on scrolling, and then it's like an hour later, and you're like, what just happened? Does that ever happen to you? Right? Maybe not an hour. Maybe you're more godly than me. Maybe 20 minutes, okay? <laughs> but there's always this feeling I get after that, like, oh, man. I was, I was supposed to be doing something, right? What, what was I supposed to do? Right, you get this weird, like, empty, worthless, like, oh, no. Like, what, what was I supposed to do? Did I do that? And then, then the thing pops up, and it's like, oh, I didn't clean this or do that or whatever. It's like, oh, no, I forgot, right? Anyway, uh, you leave those things feeling so, like, oh, such a waste of time. Right? There are things that are worth your time, right? You could work out eat well, those things are, yeah, it's good for the future. Work hard at work. Those things are worth your time. But there is nothing that is worth your time more. There's nothing that is worth your time more than investing in eternal souls. Everybody is an eternal soul. We'll go to heaven or hell when they die. That's why John says in 3 John, he says, there's nothing that's better. There's no greater joy that I have than to see my children, not his biological children, his spiritual children, walking in the truth. That's the greatest joy that he ever had. I want you to have that joy too by looking at this, even just being encouraged in a preliminary way tonight by saying, yeah, I'm willing to be a spiritual leader. I never wanted to be, but I'm willing to take on that role by listening to my spiritual leaders for sure, growing in that way, but also starting with that element of humility. I want to be humble in everything I do, just like Christ was. Let's pray for that right now, then we'll talk about that in small groups. God, please help us with this. You know that we are naturally selfish and inclined to do what is most comfortable to ourselves. I just pray that you'd break us of that. I'm just thankful for this text that is so clear to us. We don't want to be proud. Um, we don't want to be foolishly immature, like 12-year-olds boasting about something that they never earned or even deserved. I pray that we wouldn't do that, even if our pride is not so on the surface, even if it's a little deeper than that. I pray that we would be challenged tonight by this text to um, embrace the correction from our spiritual leaders, even when it's hard pray also that we would do a better job becoming spiritual leaders for other people, pushing them, encouraging them, admonishing and exhorting them to live out a life that is guided by you. pray that we'd help others do that. I pray that tonight would just be a solid night of us talking about that in small groups and, and applying this to our lives. Please help us with that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.